Josh, if you would like to, oh, there you are, if you'd like to come up and do the scripture reading. So um, we're continuing our summer series to the story, The Life of Elijah. And it's a powerful story because we know it's a real story. We trust the word of the scriptures and we have all the historical evidence proving the scriptures to be true. So we know that this is a true story, which makes it all the more amazing when we see the miraculous events in it. And to just give a quick recap of the things that we've talked about, we're in our third week of the series today. <clears throat> We'll see how fast I can go today. We have the nation of Israel and its 12 tribes, but it was one nation. And they, uh, after being ruled by judges, with of course, God is their actual king. They wanted a human king. God told them not a good idea, but I'll give you what you asked for. It lasted about three, it lasted three kings before it split in half. And we had the Northern kingdom that continued being referred to as Israel because it had the majority of the tribes. The Southern kingdom, kingdom of Judah, and uh, into this, we have Elijah. And he comes in at a time when King Ahab and his queen Jezebel are ruling over the northern kingdom of Israel. And as I showed you a couple Sundays ago, if you go down a list of the kings of the northern kingdom, <clears throat> you don't find a single good godly king listed. And of all the bad kings that ruled over the northern kingdom, the worst is Ahab. And so eventually, because of their sin and their stubborn refusal over and over again, God eventually 
even with his long suffering and his patience, eventually says, okay, then there's a, a consequence to your sins. I'm going to remove my hand defending you. And they get conquered by the Assyrians. And then later, King Judah stays faithful longer, but they're eventually conquered as well by the Babylonians when they turn against God. And so uh, at this point, though, we're at the time of Ahab, and we have the two kingdoms. And Elijah comes up, and he confronts King Ahab. Elijah is from Tishp, and he's in Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. And sometimes the northern kingdom is referred to as Samaria. The capital is kind of used as a title for the whole area. And he goes and confronts Ahab about his sin, about leading all the people into worshiping this false god Baal and a false goddess Asherah. And he says that God is going to cause a drought. And he says, the drought will start when I pray. And when I pray again, the drought is going to stop. And that is kind of a slap in the face to Ahab and to this God that he has brought into the nation through his queen Jezebel of Baal, because Baal is supposed to be God of fertility, a God of rain. And so if there's a drought. That's an insult to what this God is supposed to be able to have control over. And so once he lays down this challenge, Elijah leaves and he goes to the brook Kareth, where God miraculously provides for him using ravens. And then when the brook runs dry, God tells him to travel again. He goes up out of Israel to the area of Zarephath, and that's in Sidon at that point. And Sidon is where Queen Jezebel is from. So he goes kind of into his enemy territory. And that's where we left off until we got to the scripture reading today. <clears throat> So a couple of things to notice. Um, number one, you might notice that uh, I asked Josh to stop reading there at verse 18, and it's it's kind of in the middle of a section. If you're reading, I think pretty much any of our modern English translations, it doesn't stop there. And so just a quick reminder that we don't always need to stop reading where chapters end or where there's a new header in you know in in your translation, whichever one that might be. And that's because. Originally, those chapters and those headers and those verse numbers, they weren't there. Those were added, chapters and verse numbers were added in in around the 1200s. And they're good things because they were added in to help us more easily find spots. Like if I said, find the part in the Bible where Elijah is, you know, going to go reconfront Ahab and there was no verse numbers or chapter numbers, that would be a hard place to find. So they're helpful. But there are they're not a, a biblical play, a biblical idea in there to say stop reading here. It's a broken thought, and I think that's in some ways not as good sometimes because if you're reading, especially through like some of the smaller books of the Bible, you don't need to stop at the chapters. If it's if it's six pages, read the whole book, <laughs> and uh, and so sometimes it gives this idea that uh, there's a stop or a uh, a new change to the idea where there might not necessarily be one. So. That's one thing. The other note is we need to understand what a prophet is in the Bible. And a prophet is not necessarily someone who can tell the future because we see references to prophets in this, this section. Um, although biblical prophets sometimes were given visions of the future by God. But the main purpose of a biblical prophet is to declare a message from the Lord to the people. Most of the time, a message that people don't want to hear. And uh, when I was getting trained to be a pastor, one of the things that they said is you have to some you have to have a prophetic voice. Uh, you have to declare the word of the Lord. Sometimes people aren't going to want to hear it. <laughs> um, but that's what the prophets often did. And so uh, we don't get information about the hundred prophets, pretty much any information that we talk, we see later referred to. But uh, we know that that's the biblical role prophets had. So it starts off beginning uh, in verse one, chapter eighteen. It says, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So the third year of what? Presumably the drought. And uh, because it doesn't really track time otherwise, it just says third year. We're assuming it's the, referring to the drought. And we actually see, if you skip way ahead in the Bible, Luke 4.25, Jesus gets more specific. And he says it was three and a half years. So uh, obviously Jesus is going to know best. So we're going to um, go with what he said here. And it's. Three years, but more specifically, there's three and a half years of drought here. And that is a long time for drought to last. And we don't know where Elijah was during all this. Did he stay in Sidon? Was it just this traveling and then staying in Sidon for that whole three years? We don't know. But wherever he was, as we'll see, he was being searched for, and they could not find him. 
But then back to verse one, it says, go and present yourself to Ahab. I will send rain on the land. This is God speaking to Elijah. And so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. And that's, again, one of those things I think that we could skim by real quick as we're wanting to see what else happens in the story. But it's a a part worth pausing and thinking about. Because what we see Elijah doing over and over again, and we see again here, we talked a bit about last week, is God commands, Elijah does it. He doesn't hum and haw. He doesn't do as we see some other biblical figures do, where he tries to argue, I shouldn't be the one that has to go do that. I'm sure Elijah knew Ahab was looking for him, and that Ahab was not going to be happy about the guy who came up and declared there was going to be a drought three and a half years earlier. And I'm sure Elijah knew a king could have him killed from a human perspective very easily. But he gets commanded by the Lord, no hesitation, goes and does it. And I think that this is just a part of having a Christian life of faith is the Lord tells us to do something. We need to do it. And then oftentimes there's a wait, right? We have to wait and see the Lord bring his promise to fruition. And that's what happens here with Elijah. He, uh, it doesn't start raining the moment the Lord tells him it's going to start raining. He's taking the Lord at his word. He's, he knows the Lord keeps his promises. And so he go, goes and does the Lord says, knowing the Lord's going to keep that promise. And then it says, continuing in verse 2, Now the famine was severe in Samaria, of course, because of the drought. And Ahab had summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator. And then it gives us this interesting side note here. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and had supplied them with food and water. So who, who is Obadiah here? He's obviously a follower of God, and he's essentially acting as a spy for God in Ahab's court. And other than that, we don't know much about him. This is not Obadiah the minor prophet. That would have been significantly later. But Obadiah has saved a a remnant of God's people in these two caves. And that idea of God always preserving a remnant of faithful people amongst the unfaithful is something we see repeated throughout scriptures. And that's something that's good to keep an eye out for as you're reading through the scriptures is this idea of God keeping a faithful remnant. And we see it right up in the New Testament when Jesus talks about how there's a narrow way and a wide way. The wide way leads to destruction. The majority of people are going to go that way. There's always going to be a faithful remnant that the the Lord keeps for himself. And when I read this part of the story, it makes me think of Nazi Germany, the people who took it upon themselves and risked their own lives to hide Jews to keep them safe from a government that wanted to kill them. And that's what Obadiah is doing here. And he knew Ahab and he knew Jezebel and he knew they were killing prophets. And so he uses this position that he has and he uses this authority that he has to save some of them. So it goes on to verse five and Ahab tells Obadiah that they're going to go with search the land and they split up and they're looking for even just some grass to feed their animals. And that's how desperate a situation is becoming. And if you're like me, it's kind of hard to imagine what it would be like with a big drought like that. We're very blessed. We're by the Great Lakes. We have it, correct me if I'm wrong. Are we, do we have the biggest freshwater area in the world? Is it the Great, the Great Lakes the biggest? I think it is, right? So we don't really have to worry about droughts here. So it's hard for me to imagine. But I, uh, I did find something that can help us kind of compare it. And so uh, if you look on a map and you kind of compare on the lines that go across it, Israel and California are kind of similar as far as how close they are to the equator. So this kind of similar amount of heat that they get. California's a little closer to the equator. This is California in July of 2011, Lake Oroville. And this is the same spot three years later uh, during a drought. I'm going to go back and forth so we can see it a little bit here. And uh, if you'll notice how much lower the water is, how much less of the water there is, and you can just see by the dirt how much the water has dropped in those three years. Here's another one, another part of Lake Oroville. And you can, 
I mean, you can see what was a full lake as now it looks, by comparison, looks like a trickle. And that was, that's what was going on in California. And so we know in a, an approximately the same amount of time, what was going on here during this drought and then the, the famine that came with it. So imagine living in that hotter kind of climate, having such sparse access to water, finding it hard to get food, having to ration water. And one of the things I would imagine that you would do is eventually you would let the animals, you'd have to let them die if it's hard to feed the people, then you have to let some of the animals die. Which makes it more confusing to me when you see Ahab, the king, and he's like, let's go out, let's find some food for the animals. The scriptures don't give us a lot of detail there, but it seems to me like, as a king, your priority should be, let's find anything we can get for the people to eat and let come what may with the animals. What we see with some of the ancient writings is there's uh, another ancient king, and according to his records, Ahab was known for his military, a significant part of which was thousands of chariots. The chariots aren't going to do you much good without animals. I'm making some assumptions here. This is not direct from scripture, so bear that in mind. But it seems like Ahab might have been going to search for food for his war machine, his chariots, instead of for the people. And that would be bad enough. But then think about the contrast here between what Ahab is doing now and just a few verses earlier. We have a king, a king of Israel, Israel that the Lord made his people, Israel that the Lord gave his law and his commands to. And the king should know, serve God, obviously protect the prophets. Instead, we have him trying to save the lives of his animals, and he's okay with the, with the prophets being killed. There is some brutal, ironic contrast there. And if he had just accepted the responsibility for his sin when this dread started, recognized it as condemnation from God, if he had repented of his sin, tried to correct the way that his nation was going, turn them away from worship of false gods back to worshiping God, I'm sure that God would have shown him at least some level of mercy because God wants to show us mercy. We see that in the scriptures over and over again. He's a God of love and a God of mercy. He only punishes us when he when we will not relent, when we will not repent. If he had just repented, things could have been very different. But instead, more sin, worse sin, worse rejection of God. And then we get that interesting exchange between Obadiah and Elijah. I found this artwork online. And uh, Obadiah bowing down before Elijah, my Lord Elijah, so obviously not calling him Lord, but recognizing his authority as God's prophet and authority over him and recognizing the power that Elijah has through the Lord. And Obadiah is afraid for his life because he's supposed to go deliver this message to Ahab that he's found Elijah. And he's like, the Lord's protected you from Ahab this long. <laughs> when I bring him back here, you're going to be gone again. The Lord's going to take you somewhere else. And so Ahab has to reassure him. And Elijah is afraid maybe because Ahab will come and then Elijah won't be there, or maybe there'll be some implications since he doesn't try and capture Elijah himself, maybe that the king will realize he's got some allegiance with the Lord. Either way, he's worried about his life. But to jump back here to the role that Obadiah plays, I mean, they, he shows obviously some sense of self-preservation here, um, but we see that he is a faithful man, preserving the Lord's prophets, preserving people's lives, and it makes me think of a Colossians 3.23. And it says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And what that should tell us is, all work is sacred if we're doing it for the Lord. Doesn't matter what it is. Now, Obadiah is in a position of authority here where he can save people's lives. Elijah is in a special place of authority here. He's God's prophet. But from Colossians 3.23, any work we do, if we're doing it for the Lord, is sacred work. We could be at work cleaning toilets. If we are doing it to the Lord, we are doing sacred work. It doesn't matter. Obadiah and Elijah were both called by God to be in the places where they were. And they were very different places. The roles they were called to were opposite sides of a coin. Elijah was there to challenge King Ahab, to call him out for his wickedness and his idolatry. 
Obadiah was there to say yes to Ahab's commands while doing some things behind his back to keep people safe. But both of them were in positions God had wanted them to be. Both were serving God the best to the best of their ability in places God had put them. And just like God, just like God put Elijah and Obadiah where they were to serve him there, God has put us where we are. He's put us where we are for a reason. So we need to think about where has God put us? We need to think about, we need to try and figure out how can we bring glory to God in the places God has put us? And uh, as I was thinking about this, there's all kinds of different jobs and and things out there that have different circumstances. And uh, so I thought I'd give an example from my own life. Now, obviously, as a pastor, it's a little different from most people, how I can serve the Lord in my my role. But uh, one of my thoughts went back to when I was in Bible college and I worked at a fast food place called Fast Eddie's. And if you've ever been there, you've probably tried the crazy fries. They're very good. This is not an advertisement for Fast Eddie's. (laughs) But this is three things that I didn't consciously plan to do, but they kind of just came together in my head as I was working there, how I could serve the Lord. So one is I could do my work well. And the Bible says, do your work as if you're doing it unto the Lord. So if you have any job you are doing well, whether that be an official job or a stay-at-home mom job or any kind of job, whatever you're doing, do your work well. And it's a way of serving the Lord. You, I tried to make every customer smile. I do it on the flip side too, by the way. When I go to a, a store and there's somebody working customer service job, I know it can be miserable sometimes and people sometimes treat them like they aren't there. So I always try and make that person smile. That's a way, even a, a brief interaction, you can try and show love of the Lord to somebody. And when I was at Fast Eddie's, you know, you get like 10 seconds with most customers. Try and find some way to make the person smile. And then lastly, share Jesus. In that case, when I was at Fast Age with my coworkers, I had 10 seconds with customers. I got hours with my coworkers. (laughs) So I hammered at them every day. No. (laughs) You don't want to shove it in people's faces, but there are all kinds of ways to bring up your faith in conversation. Any kind of news or any kind of conversation that has to do with morals, you can share what you believe and say you believe this because you're a Christian. It's a natural way to bring up your faith. And so if you notice what I put in the brackets here, Again, I didn't really plan this out just the way it kind of came together when I worked there, but you're following the two greatest commandments. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So you're following, if you can follow these, you're following two of the the two greatest commandments. And then you have, of course, the Great Commission. We're supposed to share our faith no matter where we are. And... Everybody here has got all kinds of different circumstances. Maybe you don't have a job. You know, I thought, of course, of Beth, and she's a stay-at-home mom. And so I thought, you know, when she's watching TV all day. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) She's going to be angry later. I said that. That's a bad joke. (laughs) She does a lot. So the first one, do your work well. Everybody can do their work well. But second one, even if you don't have coworkers to try and make make smile, you'll be around family or you'll be around friends. How can you show love? Invite people over. That's that's hospitality. We can do that now again, right? <laughs> the lockdowns are over. So, uh, or at least the majority of it's over. <laughs> you can invite people over, show hospitality, show love to people. And then the Great Commission, you can share your faith with your family, with kids, unbelieving siblings, with friends, again, that you invite over. By the way, as Christians, we should always have non-Christians that we have relationships with because if you don't, you can't share your faith with somebody, right? So that's just what came to my mind as I was thinking about the role that Elijah plays here. And then we have, let me reread those last three verses uh, from, from our passage today that Josh read earlier. Verses 16 and 18. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah said. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and you have followed the bows. If you think back through, I mean, you can think back through any human experience, through your own life. But if you think back to the beginning 
of the Bible, and you look at the story of Adam and Eve, you see a human behavior that is prevalent to some extent in everybody. And that is trying to pass the blame, not wanting to accept the blame for something that we've done. You see that with Adam and Eve, very first sin, eating from eating tree from the fruit they're not supposed to, and their first response, Eve blames the serpent, Adam blames God and Eve. This is the woman that you gave me, gave me the fruit for me to eat. So he's, he's blaming God and Eve. Adam's basically like any living thing other than me, it's their fault. And we see that happening here. But we see it, like I said, regularly throughout life. Politicians are masters of it. If you can be proud of mastering something like that, I guess. But all of us have done it at times. We want to pass the blame. And sometimes in life when we've done something wrong and somebody points it out to our faces, instead of admitting we've done something wrong, we get angry. We do not react well. Uh, there's a quote here. This is not from a biblical scholar, but nonetheless, I, I thought there was, uh, some wisdom, there was good wisdom to it. This is George Orwell, the author of the book 1984. He says, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. And I think we can see that in our culture as uh, Canada moves away from Christianity, the states moves away from Christianity to some extent. Again, we're very blessed in the freedom that we have here, but there are things moving away from Christianity and people don't want to hear some of the truths from the scriptures and they can get angry. They can hate people who say it. And we see that kind of reaction from Ahab here. Even divine judgment, the drought and the famine had not caused Ahab and Jezebel to turn back to God instead of repenting of their sins, their idolatry, worshiping false gods, instead of accepting their guilt and their blame, rightfully having led the whole nation into worshiping false gods, they instead say, Ahab says to Elijah, O troubler of Israel, when it's Ahab who had caused all these problems in the first place, led the whole nation astray. And next week, we're going to see how that confrontation ends up going on Mount Carmel, one of the most, probably the most famous uh, story in, in Elijah's life. And it's nothing short of miraculous and one of the most dramatic confrontations, I think, in human history. So we'll see how that ends up going for Ahab. But even through all this drought, years of drought and famine, he still was not willing to recognize and accept and repent of his own guilt. When I think about when I think about that drought, you guys ever seen the movie Three Amigos? I think it's from that movie where you see the three guys and they're out in the desert, nothing to drink. One tries to drink from his canteen. There's only a couple of drops. Then I think Martin Short tries and a bunch of sand falls in his face. <laughs> and the third guy tries and he drinks a whole bunch of water not noticing his friend's difficulty, and then chucks the canteen, lets the rest of it pour out. <laughs> but you're going through all that drought, all that suffering, and he still just will not accept that this is his own fault, that the God that he's worshiping failed him, and that he needs to turn back to the right God. Nothing can save us from the consequences of our own sin. We cannot avoid it. We cannot backpedal ourselves away from it. We cannot deflect it onto somebody else. Nothing can save us from the consequences of our own sin except Jesus Christ. We need to repent and turn back to the Lord. We stand guilty of treason against the king of all creation. We stand guilty of sin before almighty God. And we deserve condemnation. But we need to be grateful because we have salvation available Jesus has made it available for everyone. All we need to do is repent. And then we need to thank the Lord for his grace and his love and his mercy and tell other people about it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazing stories that you tell us in scripture. Lord, we thank you for your incredible miracles we thank you for the incredible moral truths that we see in the scripture. But Lord, most of all, we thank you for the spiritual truths that you show us. We thank you for stories like this that remind us that we can sometimes be so stubborn. 
and show us the guilt that we have before you as we have sinned against you, almighty God. But Lord, we also thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and rose again on the third day. And Lord, we thank you that because of that, we know that we get to rise in the next next age and the next life. Lord, we thank you for all these things and we pray you would use us and use uh, all this as encouragement for us to speak your truth boldly. In Jesus' name, amen.